Tally ho, tally ho, angels at three o'clock, um, uh, and so on. Why am I? Why am I? Why am I doing that, Jim? Tell me. We're recording on the eleventh of July, and you know it's Battle Britain Day. This is when it's, it it's starts, Battle Day plus right? One officially. It's, officially. Well, you see, because I read a while ago. I read a book about the Battle of Britain. That, you know, that had lots of stuff before then as part of its pitch as to when the Battle of Britain started. And that came from, uh, really, um, looking at what Dowding had said about when the Battle of Britain began. Really, didn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he, he, he had to write his dispatch and he said, said you know, I'm, um, as far as I'm concerned, the Battle of Britain began on the 3rd of September 1939 yeah. when we yeah. declared war on Germany. Um, yeah. But we have to come up with a date. It's in many ways completely arbitrary, but I'm going to pick the 10th of July because that's when there was an escalation of the channel attacks, yeah. the canal, canal um, camp, as it was yeah. called. Um, yeah. And so we kind of commemorate it ever since. But of course, it is entirely arbitrary because, you know, you can't pick a particular day. And, and, and 609 Squadron, for example, had a very, very heavy engagement on the 9th of July. Yeah. But it depends what you mean by the Battle of Britain anyway. If it's the air defence of the British Isles... You know, it goes on forever, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose it does, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I remember, I remember when I finished my uh, my Battle of Britain book all those years ago. Yeah, um, Anthony Beaver was doing his writing his Second World War book at the time, and you know, I know actually quite well and stuff. And, and he said, oh, "I'd be very interested to, to to read this, Jade." So I, I sent it over to him. And he said, "I think you've got a major problem because the Battle of Britain doesn't actually start until page four hundred seventy nine." I kept saying, "The whole point, Anthony, is." But it it's, starts it in May. That's the whole yeah. thesis of the book, which somehow yes. is kind of which somehow had, somehow had bugged, had, well, it bugged him. Certainly, when I was reading the audio book, um, I kept looking at my watch, wondering when it was going to start. But um, <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool, past eleven. Yeah. Um, uh, now we've I mean, I've, we've talked about this a lot that we're living in um, living in a history book currently, aren't we? I mean, there are going to be rows and rows of books about right now, but. We're currently undergoing, um, and we, we 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 went on Adrian Childs the other day to talk about this um, uh, on Five Live on Friday morning, which was an interest. Which is always interesting because you go on the radio, you can't see anyone, you can't see anything. Who knows when you're going to when you're meant to speak oh, and all that. Right I, I mean, I I mean, I think we acquitted ourselves well, but I find it very I find it very very difficult. I don't know how you find it. Oh, nightmare! I kept thinking, yeah, is that the end of our sentence? Is Adrian yeah. about to come in? Is this the point where I interject? Because, you know, obviously, when you're yeah. doing these things, the whole point is to try not to cut across one another as far yeah, as you yeah. possibly can. But, you know, it's inevitable. But, he's, but he started off by saying, saying you know, um, um, <laughs> Boris Johnson's great hero is Churchill. You know, what similarities are between the two? We just went none whatsoever. Well, I mean, apart from, I mean, because I, 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 I thought I, I tried to I tried to say, well, you know, you could argue that they both start in a very strong position politically. And then what happens is their approach, um, the thing that they've been brought in to do, you know, and uh, Chamberlain was brought in to be sort of straight and moral and sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, like uh, super competent. Whereas Boris yeah. is brought in to sort of like booster everyone through, you know, everything's to be yeah. fine. Don't worry, we can fix this yeah. as long as we apply ourselves. And the thing is, is in three years for both of them, that approach has complete for both of them it completely unraveled didn't it um, yes uh, yes and you know because i think so interesting with, with chamberlain you know that that i mean i you know obviously i've been reading that david french book again and he really emphasizes the effect that crystal nacht has politically on the on on british foreign policy and on the conservative party in particular right. because you know they've they've gone through all the business of of Munich and all the agonies of Munich and Chamberlain going off to Munich and do, not telling him what he's going to do and coming up with a deal and all the endless agonies of it and the, and and then Kristallnacht happens and basically there's this palpable moral revulsion in the country about yeah. what's happened and it and it and it means that we can't do any more deals with these people why did we do a deal with these people just now what have we what yeah. oh god what have we done is what seems to happen in it after crystal act and he really really emphasizes that point he says that that's the because the british have been trying you know have been doing this moral foreign policy idea and, and we talked the other week about how in all their memos to each other they go we really are the best people in the world when we stop and think about it <laughs> all this sort of yeah. stuff and you know thank, come on let's they, face facts 
<laughs> exactly. And the British Empire is the sheet anchor of the world and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and the Americans, God bless them, they just don't really, can't really be relied on the French, you know, all that, right? And then, and then, and that, and then that moral, that moral stance is what puts people off Versailles and, and sort of is the thing that Hitler's able to then play with and, and get some traction politically out of the British. You know, like self-determination of peoples. Well, what about my people? He's able to do that. And, and that same moral, moral thing is what's also driving appeasement partly. And then the minute the Germans do something super visible that's plainly completely um, wrong and bad and uh, appalling, the moral thing goes, uh, the, the moral contingent go, oh, Christ, what have we got ourselves into here? And he, uh, uh, and, and I think, so there's that drip, drip, drip you know, that, that, whereas I don't think maybe Partygate is, I mean, I don't, you know, if we're, if we're, if you've got to do the parallels, but I mean, I tried to say, I mean, I did say, um, the differences are bigger than the similarities, I think, <laughs> when it comes to Chamberlain and Johnson. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, but his question was 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 w w what similarities were there to Churchill? I mean, you're yeah. right in so much so that Churchill is a kind of, you know, he he he's he's certainly not anti-establishment, but you know, he's he's in a different mould to any other Tory MP. Um, yeah, th that's for sure. And, and he's coming in on a kind of sort of on a sort of slightly wham bam ticket, isn't he? I mean, he's, yeah. he's yeah. his cloth is cut completely differently to that of Chamberlain. So I yeah. suppose from that, yeah. you know, if you can compare Boris Johnson to Theresa May, I suppose, and Churchill to yeah. Chamberlain. But as you say, the, the 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 lack of you know the differences are far more acute than the similarities. There's absolutely no question. Yeah, about yeah, it. definitely. Definitely. Now the thing, the thing is, um, where are you? Where are you, by the way? In case anyone's wondering. Yes. Yeah, so I'm not. not, you're not yeah, yes. And if there's a, if if this recording comes out of a kind of a sort of weird hum, that is the fridge behind the bar. I'm in, I'm at the Bridge Hotel oh, in beautiful. Buttermere, which is a is a favourite spot. And the it's a fabulously old school um, hotel. It's all very genteel. You go down to breakfast, and everyone just sort of talks very quietly and chinks their yeah. crockery and cutlery as they Love kind of butter their toast. Love it. And, and all that kind of stuff. But then you get into the bar and it's all, you know, it's just like a sort of classic low-beamed kind of stone-walled... Oh, um, magic. Yeah, but, but, you know, so I'm up here with my daughter, Daisy, and um, it, we, it's become a bit of a ritual. And um, we just go yomping in the mountains for, for five oh. days. It's just completely brilliant. But actually, we're, get, we're getting low-level today because it's a bit, bit hot and we've got Betsy, our dog, with us, who's not yeah. looking quite as trim as she might do. And so we thought, you know, putting her up Scarfell Pint might be a bit much. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're going to walk the length of Oldswater today and then get the kind of steamer back. That's the idea. Oh, lovely. Oh, yeah, so it, it's really good. But, but the Wi-Fi here is a little bit dodgy, but it's only good now because I'm using the bar's Wi-Fi because it's obviously <laughs> empty. So they've been very nice to me. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I, before we, before we get, get any further into um because we want to talk about um, the Dowling system, don't we? But on Friday morning... Um, before we did Adrian Charles, I went somewhere extremely special. Yeah, where'd so you go? I went to the Spike Milligan archive. Oh yes, 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 yes. And I oh, sat. So I, so sat I should get my myself up there, shouldn't I? Really? You absolutely. You ought to just look at his stuff from 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 the war oh, because yeah. because he has. So so basically, uh, there's a Sky Arts program about Spike, and he, Spike's undergoing a little bit of a, a little bit of a sort of. Um, Rena renaissance and reassessment i think it's fair to say and so they had me in in the morning and eddie is out in the afternoon to talk about it and um they wanted me really to talk about you know that the, i mean they've listened to the podcast where we've talked about him and 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 the idea of the army as a sort of you know a conscription army in the 1940s in britain is it is a social experiment you know the, the it's yeah. It's a democratic army. It's full of people who are simply not interested in being soldiers. So, so they're interested in the idea that you know he's playing in bands and they're accommodating him. And the back chat to his officers is really interesting because because he's allowed to get away with it. And there's that fantastic story where three blokes disappear, two blokes disappear for three days. They're called into the commanding battery commanding officer Chater Jack's um, office to say what possible reason could there be for you being absent without leave for two days? And one of them goes pissed, sir. And Chater Jack says. That kind of honesty ought to be valued in the British Army. No charge. <laughs> let's them go. <laughs> right. How fantastic. So, so where is this archive? And how can one well, access it's in, it? Well, it's, so it's in Finchley. Um, yep. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a place, um, a, 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 a sort of arts centre, community centre in Finchley, because he lived in Finchley. Before he moved to the south coast, he, he lived in Finchley. He was a big, big Finchley fan. I think Peter Sellers and he, he used to live quite close to each other. And they've put this house to one side in the 
in the in the grounds of this uh, lodge, Frontier Lodge, I think it's called in um, right. Finchley, and it's a two up, two down that's just brim full of spike stuff. And so, what's really really interesting, uh, uh, and the, the the director said, well, you know, what what I think is really interesting is that one of the things the army taught Spike to do and said, you know, he's a soldier. Don't forget, he's a soldier. And the, the first bit of direction he had in his life was when he joined the army because he was sort of listless playing in bands and mucking about before, before the war came, is that they taught him how to file. And so there are box files of, abs- of Spike Milligan's entire life in there. Whole, how extraordinary. A box file called, you know, Shows I Know the Family Have Seen. A box file called um, Edgington Songs. So his best friend, Harry Edgington, who then emigrated to New Zealand... Um, uh, after the war, there's a there's a box file of all his songs. There's um, you know, uh, box files of specials he did Australian because spe- he did some specials in Australia. All this stuff, right? And then twelve spike twelve scrapbooks, and the scrapbooks, if people are familiar with his war memoirs, are just full of the photos that make that are in the books. That one of the one of the Um, one of his gang had a camera took photos of everything and then when you get to Tunisia he goes unfortunately his camera was stolen um, so there are less pictures for this bit and you you know but but you but when he gets when he gets to North Africa there are his hand drawings of the of everything of the positions and stuff and mountains and where they were and what they got up to there are maps annotated maps that he's got hold of with all the positions marked and everything where he thought he was. Um, and then when you get to Italy, you, you know, it, there's, there's the, there's the, you know, there's the show bill from the Christmas show he did. And then when you get to January, 1944, there is an aerial photograph. There's the maps of, of the positions uh, um, around the Gagliano where he was injured and you turn the page and then there's two pages and there's the, an aerial photo marked with the next marks, the spot. This is where I was wounded by the mortar. This is where I was evacuated from. Um, with the mountains marked, and then a picture of the of the ward in Caserta where he was, not when he was there, but a picture of the ward in Caserta where they kept him when he was, um, you know, uh, battle fatigue casualty. The telegram to his parents: We regret to inform you that, um, you know, nine nine five four zero nine five whatever it is, um, uh, la- uh, signal a bombardier, lance bombardier, whatever it is, Milligan has been injured. But we c- can't tell you which hospital he's in. We don't know where he is. You know, yours regretfully on the on the behalf of the army council. Someone signing for someone else. All this stuff, and then you and then again you turn the page, and then he's in sort of he's into that. He's downrated to B. He's um uh so he's not fit to fight, and he spends this sort of life painting and and doing concert parties and stuff. But that scrapbook, the bit around the fighting he does in the, you know, it, it's all, he's got Amazing. maps, he's got it all marked out. It's absolutely extraordinary. And what about diaries or anything? Did he keep any diaries? Yeah, he kept diaries. So there's diaries too. Yeah. And the diaries are there? I think the diaries are there, yeah. I don't want to say yes, Whoa. they are, but I think, I'm pretty sure they are. Okay, um, well, I need I mean, to get I, myself up there, PDQ, don't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he, you know... The, the the thing I was really struck by looking through the looking through the scrapbook is um, there's lots of pictures of them moving on and so because he right in the in the book you get this drip drip of how tired he is and then basically yes. before he has before he's injured and he has his breakdown he's just talking about com- being completely exhausted all the time but then his diary he says he slept all night so he's gone beyond being able to sleep it off in terms yes. of. Yes, in, yes. It, it, in terms yeah, of his exhaustion. Yeah. You know, he's done. And and in the scrapbook, you really get the sense that they were moving. You know, they dig, they'd dig a bloody great position for the heavy guns and then they'd, then they'd have to move again and they'd move, pack it all up, move again and then dig another one and then move again and, and even without yep. firing the guns. And I think you get this. And also, because he's a signaller, he's going up to the OP, he's running a wire back to the CP, telephone wire back to the CP, and then very often going up to the OP to man the radio. Because when he's injured, he's carrying batteries up to the, up to the yeah, OP. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So it, it, it's... Um, so anyway... Um, I, I, it, well, what a treat. I, 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 yeah, it was an amazing... Loved um, it. Oh, God, it was incredible. And he sat at the desk with his typewriter and yeah, uh, lovely. Spike Milligan Productions and, and then his yeah. 1959 well, it's that, diary. It's that, tacti- which, it's that tactile link, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a check from the BBC for 63p on the wall as well, which is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I uh, well, I I need to get in touch with these people. Have you got a yeah. contact there? You can. Fire I can over. get. I can. I can sort one. That would be great. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. that would be great. <laughs> anyway, really? we oh, were gonna... what a, how exciting. So, yeah, so should, should we do parish notices now? We, got, we, should, yes, we should mention we have Ways Fest, shouldn't we? Um, yes. Which is... Gosh, imminent. You know, it's, it's imminent, yeah. Week after next. So week on Friday. Yes, not, and the yes, weather looks exactly. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Unless there's some sort of dramatic sea change, but but it, it yeah. all look, the weather looks set fair. So I don't think anyone's going to be getting wet, which is really, really good news. Um, yeah. So, you know, there are still some tickets around if, if anyone wants to come. Lots of people to see, yes. lots of things to do, lots of hardware, yeah. lots of guns going bang at the middle of the night. Um, yeah. Um, lots of beer, all the good lots stuff, of food, yeah, all the good stuff, all the good stuff. Um, I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a battlefield tour in October. Uh, Brothers in arms, so it's like obviously a shameless link to the book, uh, but we're going from <laughs> from 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 Cowshot in Hampshire all the way through to Karlshofen um, between Bremen and and um, Hamburg. So we're going to follow basically the entire route of the Sherwood Rangers from D. But you're not going to, right you're not going to take eleven months doing it though. No, no, no. We're going to take like eleven days, right? Um, so it's going to be quite full on, but I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ever going to do it again. So if anyone yeah. wants to come and wants to come and see all these places, if they've if they've read and enjoyed the book and they've seen, they want to see what Onda Fontaine looks like or Giel yeah. or I don't know where they pass through in Cleve or whatever yeah. it might be or Geilenkirchen, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yeah. or crossing the Noiro. This is the time to do it because yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and I've got some. I've got Steve Prince coming along, um, who's oh, just brilliant. brilliant on that context. And also I've got Carl McDermott, who's a, literally knows more about the Sherwood Rangers than any other person alive. Yeah, um, and he knows all the details about all the personnel and stuff. So he's on hand as well. So it should be it should be quite fun. And if anyone wants to do that, you go to the Trip Smiths. But if you just, if you just Google Brothers in Arms Trip Smiths, it should come up. But anyway, yeah. That, so there's that. Um, there was something else. What, what was it? I can't remember. Anyway, it's gone. But those were the two <laughs> main bits <laughs> I had to mention. But, but uh, yes, other but, exciting news is I've got I've, I've bought a Bedford MW. Uh, now, now this right. So this is a this is a tale of um, you know a Dodge not being enough, isn't it? Basically. Well, no, it's not that Dodge is not enough. Dodge is absolutely brilliant, um, and uh, I love my Dodge, and, I, and I'm I'm going to regret getting rid of it, but I can't have two. Um, but I've just increasingly <laughs> felt I needed to go British rather than American. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I knew this was going to be a very, very hard sell on Rachel. And she went, oh, well, let's see the pictures of it then. And anyway, yeah. as soon as she saw pictures of it, she noticed that the, the, the Bedford MW had doors where the mm. Dodge doesn't. And she went, well, that's got doors and it's right-hand drive. Okay, well, I think you should definitely get that and get rid of the Dodge. Boom. Boom. So I was in. And so. Yeah, well, it's, that is, after all, 90% of the battle. So anyway, so, that, so that's very exciting. And, and it was built originally in 1939, but rebuilt in 1945. So it's yep. got the 1945 cockpit, so, you know, um, uh, windscreen and, and canopy and all the rest of it. Uh, and yep. of course, that means it covers the entirety of the war, which rather appeals to me, I have to say. Um, yep. and I may well live to regret it, but, you know. Yeah. But so it goes. It, so you, it goes. You, you, you had to have a Bedford. Are we going to see that at uh, We Have Waste Fest? Well, I'm trying to work out how, how I can get it down there. Because I could pick... See, what I'm thinking I'd do is I could come up on the 20th. Get, <laughs> Marcus could come up with the Lloyd. Then Marcus and I could do a little foray on the Thursday over to the kind of Romford direction, pick it up, bring it back. So I just, you know, I reckon where's a will? Yeah, probably. I mean, uh, uh, how... Uh, I mean, I'm, very, how I'm very excited to take you for a spin in it, I have to say. Oh, I can't wait. And how much Lloyd Carrier um, are we going to be uh, treated well, to? Well, a, a, a <laughs> bit more, a bit more. Um, it looks pretty good, actually. Um, it, I've got to say, it's, it's one of those things that... I mean, to be fair to Marcus, he always yeah. said this. He said, you've got to sort of strip it back to absolutely nothing. And then, yeah. then it's rebuilding it from scratch. So... Um, um, you know, we were having a laugh about it at, at, at um, Chalk Valley, but but actually, you know, he's got the chassis. That's all done. That's all yep. cut. It's all it's all yep. um, shot blasted and cleaned yep. up and painted. Yep. He's starting to put um, the um, what, what the transmission is now on um, and uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, lots of stuff is lying around in the in the workshop that's been kind of shot blasted and given that lovely rusty kind of russet red. Yep paint treatment yeah um, all the all the the um um all the armor and, and and the plate around it that's all in a shelf so i'm hoping he's yeah. going to bring as much of it as possible but it's, it is just suddenly starting to look really good and we have yeah. got we bought a, a new va engine for 400 quid which is an absolute steal yeah. um which yeah. is in really good working order um, yeah. and i think he was he picked that up last end of last week 
Yeah. So it's all starting to kick off, is the long and short of it. Um, and, it and, and it was interesting because when I went there the other day and caught up with him, I, I did suddenly think, oh, OK, this is really starting to, yeah, you know, take shape here. I, I, I'm starting to see this. This is so, magnificent. Yeah, it Excellent. is. But yes, so we were going to talk about we were going to talk about, we were um, going to the, talk about the system, the Dowding system, because um, yeah. uh, if it is if it is the start of the Battle of Britain, well, of course, which remains permanently open to conjecture, and uh, what we don't want anyone listening to this podcast to think there's a definitive answer to when the Battle of Britain starts. I just want to no. just want to put that out there. <laughs> Anthony Beaver thinks it starts uh, at a different time to James Holland. I, oh, I'm that's fine. agnostic. That's fine. Uh, it's fine. That's that's how history works, right? And yeah. I'm 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 entirely agnostic on this. I basically agree with the last person I spoke to about when the Battle of Britain began. Anyway, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, um, the 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 doubting system though is actually the 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 key to the whole thing. It, um, yes. The doubting system is is um, uh, because you know in writing in writing my um, command book, I've it's been all. Um, soldiers it's all been land forces people because in it, kind of in my view th it's the army that gets off to the worst start in the second world war the, of the yeah. three british services yeah. the, the RAF, although the RAF botched strategic bombing i don't it, you sort of can't really see how they might get that right from a standing from the start they're offered uh, and the navy the navy sort of you know they have their calamities but th that's the sort of nature of the navy if you sink a big ship it it it, it has a big sort of morale impact but whether the rest of the things running to time which is what we've talked about before but the uh, but the air force the doubting system arguably is a sign that there are some people that, who are thinking about actually what the possible threats are actually how you deal with them and bringing everything to bear to fix them and then that that works it's it's sort of it's it's you know it, it, after all, the army thinks it's getting everything ready, right, in the right order in order to fight the European war it's expecting to fight. But the Air Force on this, in this is different in, the, in this respect. that they, they get it right, pretty much, don't they? Yeah, it's the most, it, it's the most extraordinary thing. And when, I mean, the thing is, you just take radar, I think, for, for kind of granted. You know, Britain had a radar yeah. chain, so therefore it was all fine. Yeah. Um, and, and I think very few people understand how this all works together. And that actually the radar is only one cog in a very complicated cog. Uh, yeah. Not complicated cog, but in a, in a system of different cogs. The whole point about it is that it actually it is it's 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 got complex um, um, sophistication and, and new science involved. Yep. Yep. But the whole point about the dining system is it's incredibly simple. So standardization and coordination um, uh, and centralization are absolutely the key and to understanding the dialing system but i think well what i was going to say is, is that obviously there's this there's a huge amount of chit chat going on in the late 1920s and 1930s about exactly what's going to happen with air power in the future yeah and of yeah. course there is the famous line you know the bomber will always get through which was stanley baldwin's point yeah but, but if the british prime minister is saying the bomber's always going to get through then obviously it's the job of the air ministry to make sure that that's proved wrong so yeah. that so, so that's a quite a, a, a an apocalyptic kind of vision so therefore, it's really worth putting your best minds onto this to kind of see, well, what can we do about it? Yeah. yeah. And, and how can we make sure that it doesn't happen? I'm sorry yeah. about, about there's some hoovering going on in the background and everything. So everyone just <laughs> bear with me if there's some sort of weird sort of pub um, closed time noises going on in the background. But anyway, it can't Brilliant. be helped. But, but, but the person who oversees this is, is, is Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding. And Hugh Dowding yeah. is, the, is the, uh, the Air Ministry and he's in charge of research and development, R&D until 1938, when he becomes the first commander of what then becomes Fighter Command. It, it, yeah. It's been, it, it, it's been the Metropolitan Air Force, hasn't it, before that? Yeah. And then it's yeah. all kind of put into commands in 1938. So Bomber yeah. Command, Coastal Command, Training Command, Fighter Command. And Fighter yeah. Command, although you think of fighters as sort of, sort of as aggressive and attacking, they are your defensive weapon, effectively. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's the point of them. That's how they're going to be used. In, in any air defence system. So yeah. Dowding, first of all, when he's been head of, um, of R&D, research and development, has been thinking, OK, well, what, what, what have we got here? Um, and of course, he gets in touch, you know, he's, he's, in, he's put in touch with um, um, Robert Watson Watt, who's, who's yeah. the British inventor of radar. He's not the inventor of radar, but he's in, the inventor of British radar um, yeah. and, and that system and, and the work they're doing uh, over in, uh, on the Suffolk coast. And... Um, 
goes, hang on a minute, you know, there's actually something here. So start, the, the seeds of this all start to come together. But radar is only one thing. And in the case of Robert yeah. um, Watson, what's radar? It's only one directional. So whatever direction, you, where, where you plant your radar masts, yeah. it, can, it can go in an arc outwards in front of you, but it can't go once, once, it's, once an aircraft or, or an alien um, air form has gone past it. That's it. So yeah. that is not going to be enough. And how do you use it? And of course... Radar is also being developed all the time and, and, um, and becoming more sophisticated. So the original what's and what one is, is what comes to be called, um, comes to be called um, chain home, which is this, these are the 270 foot, 360 foot. So you have, you have yeah. ones that send out signals and you have ones that transmit and you also have yeah. ones that receive. So the receivers yeah. and transmitters, so they're two yeah. different miles. And one's about, if I remember right, about 360 foot high, and the other one's about yeah. 270 foot high. Yeah. So what you tend to get on a radar chain is six masts, three of each. Yeah. Um, so you see them, and you can still see them, um, you, you know, you've seen those photographs of, of them above Dover and, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And chain home can reach about 120 miles, something like that, but it's quite kind of vague about what... what and, and, and these these signals, these pulses come back and they're seen on a on a cathode ray tube screen yeah so this is like a tv screen with little yeah. luminous blips on it and a bit like a sort of sonar screen i suppose for, yeah for, for one of a better analogy yeah and um and what you get from 120 miles is is just matter it's just a sort of mass of kind of little lights and you can't really yeah. tell which is an aircraft it, yeah. you know, it could be a flock of swans or yeah canadian geese or whatever yeah yeah um and then later on you've developed chain chain low which is much more it's much more detailed but the range is much shorter so you want those in tandem basically so so then you start building chain chain low alongside the chain home yeah um, and then so you're getting two lots of different bits of information and of course the big information from 120 miles you know that's like a oi oi something afoot yeah. You know, I can see something over kind of roughly in the direction of kind of Santo yeah. Mare kind of yeah. area. Chain low then kicks in as it's getting close to the coast, sort of 20 miles, yeah. 30 miles away. So you can update it all the time. Yeah. But so, so that's your radar. And that only goes to the filter room at RAF Fighter Command headquarters. Yeah. Now, obviously, the, the thing about it is you've got to train these people. So the people that are manning the stations, they've got to be able to learn to identify this stuff yeah. as accurate as they possibly can. And that takes a little bit of time. But they're in pretty good fettle by, by the summer of 1940. And obviously, as that, that, that air activity intensifies, so they get better and better and better at it. Inevitably. Yes, cause, because that's one of the, the things about the downing system. When they, I mean, this is the other thing, is when they first start using it, they haven't, it's new, they haven't used it before. They haven't used it like this with, with, with mass formations of aircraft or anything. You know, it's the, 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 no. the, the first month or so, they're still really finding their feet with it as a system, aren't they? Because cause it's, brand, it's brand new and there's no way of Fine, testing it like, like that. Um, it, it, it's impossible. I mean, what's interesting though is there's, some, there's quite a lot of redundancy built in, though, isn't there? It's the radar. A lot of the a lot of the RDF covers they, they, it covers each other, which yep. is which is which which is for there's two purposes to that. One is because they know it's going to be attacked, and once the Germans cotton on what it is, they're going to they, they're going to be uh, directing strikes against it. But also, it, it increases your possibility of, of um, figuring out where people actually are because you're getting two sets of two sets of or three sets of information as to where this um, incoming... Well, and sometimes five or six pieces exactly, of information. Exactly, exactly. Which then, in the filter room, have to be um, uh, uh, processed, analysed and updated. I mean, they're, they're, it's a 90-second cycle, isn't it? They're ticking through um, with, with the, with the um, fine f identifying where the stuff's coming from, what range it's at and what speeds it's going at. Um, and... and they're in this permanent. Uh, once once something's spotted, they're into this permanent update uh, circumstance. And the filter room is well worth a visit. Um, uh, yes, because it's being reconstructed there now. At, yeah, at, yeah. Um, at, 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 um, yeah, at the old fight, fight, Bentley Priory at Fighter Command headquarters. Yeah, and it, and yeah. It's, yeah, and it is. It is it's fantastically clear. But I think. But but as I was saying, that you know, radar is just one cog. So yeah. it's really important to understand the, the other cogs and, and just how carefully this has all been thought through. And, the, and it's called the Downing system because Downing, first as head of R&D and then as um, the first commander in chief of fighter command, is yeah. absolutely all over every aspect of it. Now, obviously, he's got a lot of very, very brilliant people underneath him. Yeah. But, but there's all these different cogs. And what he gets is, is that 
the cogs add up to considerably more than the sum of their individual parts when yeah, they're yeah. all put together. And, and that's why it all works. And it is important to, to stress that this is the first ever air defence system in the world. There is, there is no other country in the world that has done it, despite all the chat about... Bombers getting through, um, Giulio yeah. Duhe, yeah. um, uh, the Italian kind of thinker about air power, all this sort of stuff. The Germans don't do it because they're aggressors and their whole way of war is to attack, attack, attack. So why would yeah. you need to defend? Because yeah. the whole point is your, your defence is attacking. Um, yeah. The French just don't think about it at all because they have exactly the same problems they have with every other part of their, their military, which is a, you know, splintered politics and, well, and an well, and also, of anything. Also, it's an order, a, diff, a problem of different order, isn't it? Because if you are on an island, you do, you do in theory have a, like a like the, there's, there is at least a gap, and the and the downing system is built in anticipation of not necessarily of the lowlands having fallen either, is it? That they're expecting a lot long range bomber German. The, the thing it's being built for is long range German bomber attacks. You know, like the first like the First World War. That's what yeah. they're sort of. You know the, the the difference the difference in the summer of 1940 is that the lowlands have fallen, France has fallen, and the the the, the times involved are, 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 um, in our, are, are shorter in essence for fighter command. But essentially the problem the problem is basically the same as the one they envisage. I mean this is all. I mean the thing is, is Dowding's doing this is all part of Chamberlain's sort of rearmament and and yep. uh, a fortress Britain approach to how we're going to... Yep. We'll, 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 we'll look too imposing for Germany to try and take us on. Festung we'll, we'll, England. Exa exactly. <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, a yeah. sort of weird defensive way of trying to deal with an offensive power when you're not on the continent. But the French... After all, the French, the French problem, you think about... You think about um, Eben Emael, for instance... I mean, it's, which I know isn't in France, but, you know, if you've got gliders at dawn coming from the east in, a, in the sunrise, you're never going to see them. You know, the Germans can get stuff in the air too quickly to attack France for France to have chain home, to, to have an observation corps that, that's going to help. Really? So it's, it's the. Well, it's, I don't, I don't, no, I disagree with that. They could have had an observer corps. They could have had radar stations all along the north coast and east coast. Absolutely no problem at all. Yeah, I mean, but just, I think that just, but the Germans would have been up. Germans would have been up in the air. You know, th th this is your problem when you're when you're actually sharing a border, isn't it? There's more of it's more. Diff uh, well, it's well, just yes, that much more difficult. They've got to, they've got to you know where, where Germany is attacking is through Luxembourg and Belgium into in you know through the Ardennes. So that's that's yeah. a, you know a sequence of 100 miles. They've got a, yeah. th they've got warning, which is far greater than the English Channel. Um, and they've got to and, and in the north they're going through through Holland and Belgium. So absolutely, the French could have put radar chain all along there. Yeah, but the they've north, north but border. they've spent they the money. Don't. They, but they've spent the money on they the spent money on the Maginot. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So you know, there's all sorts of reasons. But anyway, but yeah. they don't do it. That's the point. Yeah. But 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 the radar chain is just one one cog. So I think it's worth just going through the through the different cogs. And the, and the next cog on the list is absolutely the Observer Corps, which I think in yeah. 1941 becomes the Royal Observer Corps in in gratitude for the outstanding <laughs> contribution it does to the defence of Great Britain. But it is the Observer Corps in 1940. Yeah. Um, and this is originally set up in 1917 by General, Major General Sir Edward Ashmore. Uh, and this is following the Zeppelin raids and Gotha raids yeah. um, that, that are launched on London in 1917. Um, and he sets up these, um, and, and um, Ashmore sets up all these little observer posts all over the place with people just sort of on the ground looking up and reporting into a, a, a central hub, which is his headquarters in London. Yeah. Um, and this is then expanded in the interwar period. It's one of those things where they don't disband it. Um, yeah. uh, and obviously then it's increased. And then Dowden goes, well, hang on a minute, we've already got the observer corps. Now we've got radar. Oh, you know, I'm kind of seeing how this could kind of piece together. And so what you've got, uh, what you've got by 1940, summer, well, July the 10th, 1940, is, um, yeah. is a 30,000 strong volunteer force, which is organised by the police, but run by the air ministry. And weirdly, right. that doesn't cause any problems whatsoever. Um, and they're, all, <laughs> they're all volunteers. Um, yeah. uh, they're, they're complete civilians. They're given no uniform at all, apart from their own tin helmets. And... The Observer Corps is divided into groups, so groups are all all over um, yeah. uh, all over Britain. There's literally complete overlap of, yeah. of, of everything, um, and, and almost the entire um, British Isles is is covered. Um, but but absolutely on the kind of you know southern eastern side yeah. of Britain is is 100, yeah. uh, percent and with huge amount of overlapping. So you would have groups and and. Um, you, you would have groups yeah. a bit like you do 11 group, 10 group, 12 group, 13 group in fighter command, these are areas. Yeah. And then they're put into a grid, so in a number and a letter. So you, it might be J2 or G3 or something like that. Yeah. And that would yeah. be presented on a, on a map 
in the yep. in the various operations room. So you can see your groups, you can see your sector state. Well, I'll get onto that in a minute. But you can yeah. see the observer core groups, and within those groups, you would have maybe. Um, I don't know, 20 to 24, something like that. Um, yeah. Different, different um, posts per, per group, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And each post is manned by 12 to 20 men on rotation so that you've always got a team there yeah. at any given time, 24-7, 365. Yeah, and what each one would have is a hut. They'd have a telephone. They'd have team making facilities. Obviously, um, you'd have logbooks. You'd have a pantograph, which is a kind of giant sextant, um, like you would have in the old sort of you know naval navigation um, tool, um, w which which is sort of like a giant sort of circular, completely circular protractor that you have in sort of basic mathematics at yeah. school. So you can get um, a fix on. So you get a fix. So, so what you would do is you'd have your binoculars, you'd have your post, and you'd look up, and you'd you'd, you'd already know. Oh, but the, what what would happen is the radar. So the radar information goes straight to the filter room. The filter room then processes that, then feeds that out to the groups um, of the air ministry. You know, yep. the, the the fighter command rather, which yep. then filters it out to the groups of the observer corps. So the observer yep. corps group. Um, control room, operations room, would then yeah. tell the different, would telephone the post and go, okay, we've got a, we've got a hostile coming in, you know, on a bearing of, um, and it looks, you know, early estimations are, you know, eighty plus yeah. aircraft. Yeah, that would be refined again as it's picked up by chain low. Yeah, maybe only fifty plus. Yeah, then obviously the moment it gets past the radar ch radar chain, the coast, the radar is then blind, so then yeah, yeah. completely dependent on observer course. So. You've got these. You, 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 your observer core. Each post is is operating on a concentric ring around that particular post, but there's lots of overlap. Yeah. So, so your little post, your guy on your post is looking through his binoculars, and other guys on his pantograph. He's counting the numbers and goes, "Well, I can absolutely count seventy-two. Yeah. Of which I reckon, you know, twenty-five are, are bombers. Above them, I, it looks like there's a whole load of." Messerschmitt, I don't know why yeah. I'm holding up my eyes like binoculars. I don't know. It's very, it's very touching, Jim. That you're bothering with the binocular movement. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm seeing it at the pub ceiling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> uh, and, you know, whatever it might be, and then you then ring that in. That yeah. and you ring that through to your local group headquarters. Yeah. And the group headquarters then then does the filtering process to yeah. fighter command group headquarters and the sector yeah. headquarters. So you've got multiple yeah. phone lines. So uh, 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 and they're uh, feeding that through all the time, and that is being updated all the time. And how many of these? Um, uh, what are they called? These observer core positions. What are they? What, they're what just are they called observer as? observer core posts. Right. So how they're many posts? Post. How many posts are there in Kent? For example. Well, there's there's thirty to forty posts. Was well, I say twenty twenty to thirty? five or whatever um, posts per group, obviously more right. in, in Kent than ever. So yep. um, each group covers an area of, uh, oh gosh, how many groups are there in Kent? There's probably kind of, you know, um, I don't but know, there's well, probably like 50 posts and something right. like that in Kent. And, and, and so they're all, at their, the, again, they're overlapping quite considerably. So the triangulation yeah. could be pretty yeah, yeah, accurate. Yeah. Is pretty accurate because the, because they're all they you know they're all looking at the same thing from different angles to, to some extent aren't they which which exactly. allow it allows you to triangulate with 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 uh, with more accuracy and the more eyes you've got on the thing the more likely you are to get a proper estimate of the size of the exactly. formation yeah. exactly yeah exactly exactly we need to take a quick break right now we'll see you in a tick. In depth. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland, and we are talking the Dowding system. But key to both the both the Observer Corps and the um, the radar is the GPO, which is the General yeah. Post Office, which is which is nationally run by the government at that time. Yeah, and there is just the most incredible amount of engineering going on between 1937 to 1940 when radar first gets gets. Yeah. is a thing and realise that this is the key to our air defence. Because a lot of these radar posts are obviously made on really um, quite remote bits of farmland on the coast, but there's no phone line. So they've got to be, a phone line's got to be put in. Right. But there's lots and lots of, of um, a contingency put into all of this. 
Yeah. So at any at, at any one radar post, for example, you would have five different lines put in specially for this. So the first one would be right. so that you could signal to the, to the groups. Yeah. The, the fighter groups. The, the information goes straight from obviously that information from the radar train. The the cathode ray tube has to go straight to the yep. filter room. But you're also yep. passing on general information. You also yep. need to single to other stations along the coast. Well, we've just seen this. What are you picking up? Yeah, because you, yep. so you can compare notes. You know, again, yep. so you've got a second pair of eyes, third pair of eyes, sixth pair of eyes, whatever it might be. Yeah. Then you need to be able to have general operational control. So you need another yep. line for that, yep. and then you need backup lines times two in case one of them gets knocked out. So you've got five different lines, and then and that is also the same for the observer corps posts. So that you've got these these lines put in, so that you can have your telephone in the middle of a post in absolutely nowhere on the top of a hill, or in the case of Broadchort, where I live in the Chort Valley, that used to be at the bottom of um, one of the hills uh, of Church Bottom Hill. It's still got the remains of the of the blocks of the Observer Corps post, the hut right. with the tea making facilities and pantograph and all the rest of it, <laughs> and and. Um, uh, and, you know, that would have had a phone line in it. Uh, you know, so all these have got to have phone lines put in them. And they're all put in before not Jan- July the 10th, 1940. Yeah. Then you've got the um, defence teleprinter network, which is a further backup insurance. So the DTN, yeah. as it is, this is a teleprinter. So this is not a telephone, this is a teleprinter. Yeah. And that links all the core, all the groups and RAF commands all together. Right. So that so they can, a- even if there's a phone line down... Teleprinters then, chattering then, away, relaying the information. Absolutely all at the same time. And then on top of that, there's extra exchanges as well. So, for example, Bentley Priory goes through the Stanmore Exchange in Middlesex, but there's a second um, exchange which is set up specifically to handle traffic going into Bentley Priory at Bushy yeah. in case the Stanmore one gets hit. So they're never caught short. And then, and I mean, this, they, and it's this contingency, which is, I, I just think is absolutely incredible. The foresight that's been put into that, yeah, yeah is is yeah. is just amazing. So that's yeah. how that that's how. So you've got this mass of telephone lines at a time where telephones are, you know, they're not uncommon, of course, by 1940, but they're still kind of it's still in its comparative infancy. But yeah, yeah, all yeah. this stuff has been prioritised, and it's all been done in super quick order. Extra telephone lines, a lot of them are laid rather than put on posts. Yeah, um, again, because it's safer. It's considered yeah. safer. Um, and, and I think it's just absolutely incredible. Um, but that's not it either, because the whole thing <laughs> involves around radio. And, of course, the thing about the um, about Fighter Command is that they can, um, they can all communicate with one another. You know, every pilot has a radio. Every pilot has a radio. Yeah. yeah. And on top of that, so that they can... So, so the first time ever, you're not only getting all this information... The pilots, and it's not just the squadron leader or the or the commander of that particular unit that's in the air that can communicate with the controller on the ground. Every pilot can hear the controller, and so yeah. they think, well, hang on a minute, you know, the, the quality, the the sound quality isn't hundred percent brilliant. So what we need is a series of words that anyone can understand, even when it's interrupted by static, which is where yeah. you get. Angels. angels. So angels yeah. can't be anything other than angels. And it's why, you know, it's one of the reasons why you try not to use a single number eight, because eight can be, it's really hard to hear. Angels. It can be, yeah, well, eight can be used, it can, it can sound like another number it, yeah. when, it, when it's distorted. It's these sort of things. So you want words that really do make, um, that, that are incredibly clear, which is why you have hostile, bandit, um, yeah. orbit, vector. Okay, it's yeah. not about it's not about directing. It's, it's vectoring to a on a bearing of two seven zero. Repeat two seven zero or whatever it might be. So yeah. it's all really clear and everyone can understand it. And that and 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 these these code words are simple and can always be heard even though the kind of through, through the kind of distortion of static on the on the radio. So you have that. But but obviously you need to be able to the controller needs to know where his friendly aircraft are. So that's where Huff Duff comes in, and yeah. Huff Duff is high frequency direction finding and all over southern england and, and britain are these antennae on the ground which are much smaller than the radar stations which have been put up and yeah. they pick up the pulses which are emitted on a every 40 on a 14 second cycle by yeah. every single plane and this is known as pip squeak and yeah. pip squeak is is the code word for pip squeak is cockerel so quite often um you know your spitfire pilot would take off and forget to switch on his pip squeak so the ground controller will go, is the cockerel crowing? And that <laughs> means, of course, have you switched it on? Or 
you haven't switched it on. Yeah. And you then switch it on. Uh, and that means that you can then pick up... So then you can pick up where your friendly aircraft are and you can see where your enemy aircraft are. So then basically it's basic trigonometry, isn't it? Because you're looking at yeah. an isosceles triangle yeah. and you're looking at the yeah. longest line of the triangle and your 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 your, your friendly planes are on one end of the, that line and your enemy on the other. And you've got to draw a straight line and whatever that bearing is, is the bearing you need to get to, to, to vector onto those enemy planes. So if you were, let's say you were taking off from North Weald and, and you were going to attack some, some Luftwaffe planes that were coming up the leg of Kent, you might be on a bearing of, let's say for argument's sake, about 110, so 110 degrees. And so you'd be able to vector it. And, and of course... That just means that everyone knows where everybody is. And there's a further thing, which is identification friend and foe, which is a further pulse emitted from the um, friendly aircraft, which can be picked up by the radar station. So if you're out in the channel, they can see yeah. which is a friendly plane and which is, a, which yeah. is an enemy plane. And so you've got all this information. You've got this backup telephone lines. You've got these backup telephone exchanges. You've got the DTN, the, the um, um, Defence Teleprinter Network. You've got, you know, which is your planes, you know, which are the enemy planes, but how yeah. do you, how do you translate all that massive information into an easy system by where <laughs> the controller on the ground can, can see all this massive information and direct the, your friendly, your Spitfires and Hurricanes in the air. Yeah. And that, of course, is where the operations rooms come in. And, and this yeah. whole conversation was really prompted partly by the, by the um, anniversary of the Battle of Britain, but also because I posted a, um, a, a picture from the operations room in uh, Duxford, which I know you've been to quite comparatively yeah, yeah. recently. Yeah, and um, and and someone said, "Oh, you know, could you could you explain properly how the downing system works?" So that's why we're doing it. But the operations room <laughs> is the is the is is the key to the whole thing, and that one at Duxford, of course, is fantastic. This leads to this leads to a question. Uh, over the weekend, um, quite a lot of people were, were posting Battle of Britain movie quotes. Because it, yes. because it was the, the start of the Battle of Britain, as far as they're concerned. Obviously, as I said, I'm agnostic. It could be it could start any day it wants. Yeah, yeah. Um, how in danger was the system of being overwhelmed? Because one of the things, one of the sort of, you know, the because the, because the Battle of Britain movie kind of needs a story. Part of the thing is that you know the radar stations, and I always like to call it RDF. Really, um, if the RDF yeah. stations had, hadn't been, were almost overwhelmed, but the Germans then changed tack. The similar way that there's that idea that they changed tack from bombing. The airfields and the RAF was on its ass, and fighter command was, you know, was was really in trouble. But luckily, the Germans changed tack. Um, that's not the case, is it? That, because no. because after all, they don't have the means to do any one of those three things effectively. They don't have the means to take out the RDF. They don't have the means to take out um, fighter command's stations, and they don't have the means to bomb London into submission. They can't do any one of those three things, let alone two. Certainly not three. So that idea, really, that that you know that that, that they, they crash some model Stukas into a into a radar station, <laughs> RDF station, and fight command is biting its nails at the prospect of the whole thing falling apart. It's just not the case, is it? Well, they are. Of course, they're worried about it because if you're going to be attacked, of course, you're, you're, it's your job to be worried about absolutely everything. Um, um, but, yeah. but it's interesting because because the, the Germans don't have a clear handle on the air defence system at all. They they know that we've got radar. They call it DT. So how much does Beppo Schmidt, for instance, know about all this? Well, not not a lot is the truth. So they they know they've got radar. They know they've got these chains. They've seen them, and so they send off all these zeppelins the summer of 1939 up, yeah, um, up the east coast. And the British know exactly what's going on. So basically, just send out jamming signals the whole yeah. way through. So, it, so yeah. it's just distorted, horrible, screaming stuff in their headphones. Yeah. And they're yeah. absolutely none the wiser. And yeah. they know this is going on, but they have absolutely no concept that this is one cog in a massive number yeah. of cogs which yeah. all piece together to make a coordinated, yeah. centralised air defence system. So they don't know anything yeah. about that. And they think, well, we should probably get rid of the radar chain. So they, they launch a whole series of attacks the day before Eagle Day, which is the 13th of yeah. August. So yeah. the, 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 the stuff in July is just the kind of warm-up exercises. The Luftwaffe is moving up to the Channel Coast, particularly the fighter... Um, airfields need to be created yeah. all around the Pas de Calais and in Normandy as yeah. close as they possibly can to the, yeah. the coast of, of England. Uh, yeah. And so that all takes time. So they're attacking out, uh, channel, channel shipping um, and East Coast convoys and stuff in July. That's really what's going on. But the main assault is the, you know, the Adler Angriff, the attack of the Eagles, yeah. which is due yeah. to launch the moment there's 
looks like there's going to be four clear days of weather and when everyone's ready and they're kind of basically ready from the 1st of August and it looks yeah. like the first four four days of, of clear weather are going to be on the 13th of August. So the day before that, as a sort of warm-up exercise, they decide to concentrate on all the radar stations yeah. and they attack yeah. them all. Um, yeah. And they knock out the one at Ventnor, but within a matter of hours, they've sent out false pulses to make the yeah. Germans think that they haven't knocked it out. And a couple yeah, are yeah. knocked out, and that, that's basically it. And they think, oh, well, that was a waste of time. That's really difficult. It hasn't really worked, so let's not bother about it. And yeah, that's the last yeah. time they attack radar change, change. So that's just sort of complacency from the point of view of the Germans. But obviously, from a British point of view, it absolutely is a concern. But, yeah. but the, the key thing is, is how you interpret all this information. So the filter room at Bentley Priory, which is receiving purely the radar station information and, and mm. nothing else, that is all the filter room is doing is, is filtering yeah. that information from those radar stations. That is dealing with over a million pieces of information within a 24-hour period. Yeah, and and can and can disseminate those back out again to the groups and and then to the to the sector stations within about forty seconds. So it's incredibly swift. You know, it's real time basically that this is all being organised. And so what you have is you have your your groups of fighter command, and then you have your sectors, and then you have your satellite stations. So Duxford is a sector station in twelve group, and Falmere yeah. is a satellite of Duxford. So yeah. you would only have a con an operations room. Um, at a sector station. Now, the key thing about these operations rooms, these control rooms, is that they're all the same. So whether it's the yeah. operations room at Bentley Priory, the overall biggest one there is, or the one at the Uxbridge Bunker, which is the headquarters of 11 Group, or the yeah. one at, um, at, 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 um, at Duxford in 12 Group, or wherever it might be, yeah. they're all exactly the same. So this standardisation is, is, is really, really important. So you could be um, a, a controller in Drem in Scotland and they suddenly go actually yeah. um, the chap's got Covid um, so we need you yeah. to go down to Biggin Hill <laughs> and you could be you know you could get into your into you know get a trip down in a Blenheim and you could be at Biggin Hill in an hour and a half and you're yeah. good to go and everything would look exactly the same but this is what fighter command do anyway with the with the the squadrons is they're being rotated and sort of warmed up and rested and, and that, so the whole thing's interchangeable isn't it the entire system yes Yes, but I, but I think it's really worth just explaining how these operations room work because you know that one, that one at Duxford I yeah. think is completely brilliant and it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, it's, everyone always goes to the one at Uxbridge, which is in, of course incredible. But but the one at, at, at Duxford I think is just a is, a, is obviously it's slightly smaller because it's just a sector station rather than a group yeah. um, operations yeah. room. But it is still the basic thing. So what you, what you always have is you have the map table at the bottom, and the map yeah. table has a has a is a gridded map of southern england or wherever it might be yeah. northern england yeah um but in the case of duxford is southern england east anglia london north kent all that kind of stuff yeah then you've got a dais um which is a sort of raised platform looking down on the table and on that ta on that dais you would have the senior controller now he's in the center yeah. and he's slightly jutted out from everybody else so he's really looking directly down yeah. over the, the map table and he can see everything at a glance. Now he is the senior controller so he is the guy who is vectoring, yeah. directing the aircraft in the ground, yeah. uh, in the air rather. So, so let's say it's you know, at Duxford you know, 242 Squadron they are listening to the ground, the senior controller at Duxford yeah. telling them what to do and what to expect and what bearing they need to be etc etc. Next to him is the assistant controller because, again, you want contingency and you need backup yeah. in case he's got a headache yeah. or something he needs to throw up yeah. or whatever, or, or got COVID. Um, yeah. Then you've got two <laughs> deputy controllers who are all completely on it. So all of them are all completely on it and know exactly what's yeah. going on. And also the point about having assistant controllers and deputy controllers is so that they can learn the job as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pick up how to, how to do it. It's like a training exercise. Then you would have Ops A, who is in permanent contact with the group if it's a sector station. Yeah. Um, or with the sectors if it's a if it's a group operations room and then you have ops b who is who is um and he's the guy who's in contact with the squadrons immediate yeah. contact with squadrons on the ground so he's the guy who's going right scramble so that goes down to the dispersal hut on the ground so you would have your big grass airfield you know and you would have different dispersal huts say you've got three um squadrons based at wherever it mm. might be north wheeled you would mm. have each each squadron would have its own hut it might be a tent it might be a wooden hut it might be a bungalow in the case of 609 squadron at middle wallet for example yep. it's a little square bungalow that's your base that's your your camp that's where you have your tea making facilities always important and biscuits um that's where you have your deck chairs and you know 
cards and gramophone and gramophone and, and battered paperbacks yeah uh, and your your spitfires would be near there they would be parked up in 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 areas around that area and you would also have a duty operations officer in that hut on a telephone waiting for instructions from the sector mm. station and it would yeah. be the ops bee who calls her and goes scramble to that guy and he then goes shout scramble or rings the scramble bell or whatever and everyone hurtles off to off to their spitfires so so that's the, those are the people on the dais. Then you've got the beauty chorus, which are the WAFs, um, the, yeah. the, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. And there, then they've got headphones on and they've got a microphone piece. And they've got yeah. a croupier stick, this long stick, where they can move plots. And you have these little plots. And enemy um, plots are mounted on um, three levels. So they're a little wooden block with three rows on them. And so the first thing would be, um, you would have H on it, which would be for hostile, and it would have the number... So, yep. you know, 75, 11, whatever it might be, 1, whatever yep. the number it is, it's expected. Then you'd have the height and then you'd have the kind of, um, and then you'd have the number as well on it as well. So this yep. is the raid number. And you also yep. have it colour coordinated because that's where the sector clock comes in. You've got these three sections yep. of yeah, red, yep. yellow and blue on a yep. five minute cycle. And when it yep. first appears, it's blue, for example. And then in the next five minutes, it's then goes into yellow and then moves into red. So that's how you can see where you are on the timing and where it's moved compared to where it was on the first, first bit. And they're moving these around and you can see them going along the leg of Kent or across the channel or whatever it might be. And they're constantly updated. So to start off, it might be kind of 75 plus, but that might be whittled down to 52, very precisely, air, air, aircraft. And then you've got another little plot, which is of your own aircraft. And they have on the top of it, they would have a triangle with a number when they're on the ground. So it might be two when they're at Duxford. The moment they get airborne, it goes to a rectangle. Uh, a yellow rectangle with it on and that would have the number yeah. of again that would have the number of planes that might be you know 12 13 yeah. whatever whatever yeah. it is taking off so you can see exactly at a glance where these where these formations are on on the map table then opposite you've got this flat wall opposite you on the far side opposite the dais um, and that's the totes board as it's known because it looks a bit like yeah. the kind of betting totes on uh, uh, the races and that yeah. has the lists of squadrons with different loads of coloured lights on the different sections, you know, red, gray, red green, um, yellow and white for the different sections. So different yeah. coloured lights. Yeah. And it says, you know, on the ground, 30 minute readiness, two minute, three minute readiness or whatever it is, then airborne and then engaging. And when it's engaging, it all goes red. Um, yeah. And so, again, you can see the status of each of your squadrons immediately right in front of you. So your ground controller has got this visual interpretation of the air battle that is going on in the skies above, absolutely laid out with every bit of information you could possibly have in terms of height, cloud base, yeah. um, status of the squadrons, where they are in relation to, to the bombers. So he can then respond and he can see this plot of 52 moving along up towards um, along the coast of um, uh, of Kent, so the ground controller, the senior controller at yeah. the sector station at North Weald can then send off, um, you know, 249 squadron of hurricanes, whatever it might be, and say, right, you need to go on a bearing of 110 down to engage this, you know, 52 um, hostiles coming in on a bearing of three, um, 340 degrees. Yeah. And that's how it all works. And it's just genius. How much practice... Are training do they do with the Dowding system? Ask what, you know, before before things kick off, are they sending, uh, you know, uh, I mean, obviously the, the, there'll be lone aircraft going up and down, making sure that the, the RDF can see them. And then are they sending squadrons out into the North Sea and bringing them back in so they try and they can try and figure out how big, how big a formation is from the blip that they get on the cathode ray tube and all that sort of stuff. Is there, is, has there been a lot of that going on? Yeah, a huge amount of that going on. From, 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 so, so it is still in development in the summer of 1939. It's kind of almost yeah. all the pieces are already there, but it yeah. just needs honing. So that honing period is the period between, um, you know, September 1939 and July 1940. Yeah. And it's all starting to work. So what you have is, you know, quite often there's something that's picked up in the channel that's a bit looks a bit weird yeah. and they can't work it out so that's given a, a code name of yeah. x so that's an x raid so, yeah. so you know a couple of spitfires might be kind of scrambled to go and intercept this x raid it turns out to be nothing but a flock of geese or whatever yeah yeah, um, yeah. Or, or or it's a lone friendly aircraft that's forgotten to switch on his identification friend yeah. or foe um or whatever it might be so this stuff is constantly home so what it means is by july 1940 
the whole thing is is absolutely honed and and and, and ready to go. And with every passing day, of course, this is incredibly intense. The the, the battle. You think all those different people it, yeah. it, that are involved with the Battle of Britain. With every passing day and that intensity of air activity, so it's just getting honed further and further and further as people start to, you know, there's patterns that they start to recognise, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. start to become much easier. And of course, one of the one of the great failings about the Luftwaffe tactics is is that when you're sending off lots of piecemeal attacks to different airfields, it's very difficult to pick up because you know when they're coming over Kent, they might be going to Tangmere, they might be going to Hawkins, they might be going to West Malling, they might be going to any of these places. You don't know literally until they're they're right upon them. Quite often you're flying over um, an airfield which you're then not attacking to go on your way to Biggin Hill or yeah. to yeah, yeah. whatever it might be um, yeah, yeah. so you don't know but when you've got a mass formation heading up the coast of Kent it's pretty clear that they're heading for London so obviously yeah. it then makes it much easier for, for, for Keith Park at Uxbridge 11 group commanders yeah. to anticipate what the Germans are doing and respond accordingly whereas yeah. in in the August battles um, at the start of the Battle of Britain, you know, the 15th of, of August, which is the day where, where Fighter Command um, yeah. loses almost the most, and certainly the Luftwaffe, it's, I think 76, it's the worst day of losses that they have. That's the 15th of August, so that's just two days after Eagle Day. And then again, the 18th, the Sunday, the 18th of, of August, is known as the hardest day of day of incredibly intense yeah. activity. You know, the whole of southern England is just a mass of aircraft going all over the place, but no single big formations. So that's incredibly difficult to, to control. But obviously by September, when that, the air, you know, on 7th of September, when the Blitz begins and they abandon the, um, the, the, the lone air, um, airfield attacks, um, the individual airfield attacks, obviously these guys are absolute masters of their art by that point. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes it the whole controlling of it makes it much more simple, which is why um, Park, one of the reasons why Park is able to start using um, squadrons in pairs. Yeah. And it's one of the big problems of, of, of the big wing, of course, is because the big wing takes such a long time to form up by yes, the time yeah. they've got there. You know, well, in, Park is trying to trying to attack these formations before they reach the target. That's well, what they're always trying to do. I mean, the big wing, in a way, is a reflection of what the Germans are doing over the uh, over the Pas de Calais anyway, isn't it? Or, or over, over, over northern yeah. France when they're trying to assemble stuff and, you know, burning up burning up fuel. And after all, fuel, if you're a fighter pilot heading towards England is a big is a big issue. Um, uh, uh, it, the, the, it's peculiar how they're in, they're in, you know, they're, they're in mirror to each other. Actually, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, after all, this is one of the reasons why the, um, when you think about the Royal Air Force, that actually not very many people are pilots. Is that, that, that there's there's this colossal infrastructure in order to deliver yeah. the, you know, w w when when Churchill talks about the few, yeah, but but the the fewer, it's, it's, yes, the, the few are only able few, to do the many. It's the, absolutely the effort of the many, um, and yep. I think that's a it's an it, it's an interesting characterization. The few really because they're they're sort of the apex of this colossal system. And you know, this is before we bring in um, you know aircraft recovery and repair and and, and, yep. and all that stuff, which isn't strictly speaking part of the Danny system, is you know, but, but is part of how fighter command is able to have the resilience to deal with. Um, yes. The, the, the German uh, air offensive. Well, yes, and, you can, and I think you can argue that pro aircraft production and the civilian repair organisations, the, the CRO, which is completely yeah. revamped by, by Beaverbrook, these are all part of the defence system as well, yeah. you know, yeah, inherently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but, but I think it's, it, it's just, you know, if you think about the Luftwaffe, what the Luftwaffe have come up against in the past is they've, they've come up against Polish Air Force, which has no defence yeah. system. They've come up against yeah. the, the French Air Force, which has a defence system, but, but not as we know it. Yeah. Um, uh, and certainly no radar and certainly no coordination and standardisation by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they're able to destroy these things. And, you know, if you're on the defence, the whole point is, is that the, German, the Luftwaffe is able to use the, the principles of the Schwerpunkt, which they do on the ground, this idea of a concentration yeah. of force at the main point of attack. Today, we're going to attack the airfield at saint Omer. So yeah. let, let's let's send over lots of bombers, lots of fighters, and we'll do it, and we'll arrive there at eight fifteen in the morning. Well, yeah. the French Air Force at Saint Omer has got absolutely no hope of defending against that, except to just yeah. get up and take off and, and circle around the airfield and hope that they bump into some Luftwaffe. And of course, at yeah. some point they've got to come back down again. And it's a matter of chance whether they're on the ground or whether in the air. And the chances yeah. are they're going to be on the ground because obviously fuel is, is limited per aircraft and you're spending an awful lot more time on the ground than you are in the air. So that's why the Luftwaffe find it so incredibly easy because they hold all the aces and it's all about attacking yeah. and it's all about the Schwerpunkt. Yeah. But of course that doesn't work in, against Britain for the first time ever because 
we know exactly, the British, the RAF, know exactly when the Germans are coming. And they yeah. know in what force, pretty much. And they're able to respond to it. So they're able to make sure that they're not on the ground in Middle Wallop when, when they come over. And the one time, the only way of getting round this, really, is to come in low under the radar yeah. uh, and singly so you're not picked up. And this happens to um, this happens at, at, at Middle Wallop, I think, on the... Is it the 14th or 15th or something like that of, 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 of August? Anyway, whatever day it was, they come, you know, this lone Junkers 88 comes over and attacks the middle wall. Of course, there's all manner of damage, destroys one hangar, etc., etc. But he's promptly shot down because yeah. it's incredibly low and it's incredibly vulnerable. And yeah. therein lies the rub. And, and so the Luftwaffe simply haven't come up any, like anything like this before. And they're no. just not prepared for it. And they don't yeah. have enough resources to be able to deal with it either. The only way to deal with the air defence system of Great Britain is to completely overwhelm it. And, and they yeah. just don't have that strength to do it. Which is why it's so completely vital to the whole thing and why the Luftwaffe effort in the Battle of Britain fails so dismally. It was one of the, the prime reasons. I mean, I do think it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. And, and it's... And it's, it's such a brilliant system because each of those individual cogs is incredibly simple and straightforward. Yeah. But it's the, it's the marrying it all together and then this, this principle of the operations room, which is so simple and so standardised and yet is the only way you can bring all this competing information together in one visually easy to understand whole in one yeah. room. And it's just, yeah. it's absolutely magnificent. Well, um, what's magnificent is your tour de force for the last hour or so, Jim, explaining it all. Goodness. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm glad you're in a bar because I feel like I need, a, I need a drink after that lot. Well, I do too. I'm wondering if they could <laughs> call me an early point before I get my arse over to Oldwater. <laughs> no, that was brilliant, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, no, the, the, great fun. The thing that's striking is this is a thing that the British are cooked up that works. <laughs> you don't expect it to that early in the war. Well, well, no, exactly, you see. And, uh, uh, and, and yet we're determined to tell, or there's been a determination to tell the t story of the Battle of Britain as a sort of, you know, scrappy effort pulled together at the last minute in dire circumstances rather than a sort of relentless machine that's been you know oh, efficiency uh, figured out and tested and puzzled over and then and then uh, perfected uh, which well, which is sprung dirt technique yeah yeah or whatever or whatever yeah exactly exactly the ruthlessly efficient um yep. type uh, adjectives need to come out well i think we've covered that we've done we, enough haven't we <laughs> God, that's actually quite an epic an hour and a, it's hour an, and epic gym, an absolute epic gym well look we will see you all at uh we have ways fest i'm sure um the weekend after next um which is very exciting um or yep. i don't know are you are this weekend or next weekend because the coming weekend tends to be this weekend and the weekend after is next weekend so maybe it's next Fr weekend week. or this weekend friday week friday, friday week. week is friday, an easy way friday week. that's the way to do it and, and, um, and don't uh, forget if you want to come on the battle, battle of brothers and arms tour there's there's yeah. some places left please do come love to love to see you come and hang out yeah terrific um we'll see you all soon thanks for listening cheerio cheerio everyone <laughs>